course AI should be used for making decisions. It actually is not. When you talk to someone and say, do you use AI for making decisions? They're like, oh yeah, the AI gives me all the charts and insights and then I make the decisions. And I'm like, well, therefore you're not using AI to make decisions. <laughs> Believe it or not, when we engage with a client, we don't even ask the client what the use case is. Really? We actually make use of this agent-based approach to create a string of agents that represent the use case that ends up being an AI-based decisioning system. And I can build one for you in like 15 minutes. I've done it on stage without knowing what that use case is gonna be. In Miami, there's been excessive rain. Okay, so this is going to disrupt the travel industry. So American might come to you and say, here's our problem, how do we solve for the water? But you would say, how do you know the water's even your problem? Maybe you have exactly. something else. Is that what you're telling yes. me? <laughs> so that's, that's the future. <laughs> Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have a special guest. He is the CTO of AI at a company, little company, little bit, little bit, uh, called Cognizant. Babak Hojat, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Albert. And when I say little, I mean, you know, just hundreds of thousands of employees, tens of billions a year in revenue, pretty much touching every industry that there is to touch. But for our audience who might not know what is Cognizant and what does it do, could you please enlighten us? Cognizant is a services company. Uh, we are more than 360,000 employees around the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and yes, as you said, we uh, help our clients uh, move to the digital age and now move to the AI age, basically. That's how we see our role in the world. And specifically for you, we're really excited to have you here because you are one of the, considered one of the preeminent figures in your space. Uh, you worked on a little consumer product that I think most people have experienced with, a uh, little 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 assistant named Siri. Uh, big, no big deal, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it gives you a really unique position. So we're really excited to have you on the show. If you could, please, kind of, so our audience can get quickly up to speed. What is your background? Uh, and then we, of course, want to dive into the projects you're working on now. Yeah, I uh, have a PhD in AI, um, and I've been in AI all of my career, uh, most of which AI was not cool, and now it's very cool, so oh, yeah. really happy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, in the late 90s, I uh, started a company called Dejima, uh, where we did natural language interfaces. Uh, we had a very revolutionary approach to natural language. Natural language was... Uh, used to be done from the language, like let's understand the language, let's come up with the grammar and so forth. And so what we did, the main invention uh, there was to actually look at it from the perspective of um, the ontologies of what we were interacting with. In, in other words, the semantics of it, the, the meanings of it, uh, and then lay a like, soft layer of language on top of that. In fact, the approach back then even was called agent-based uh, approach. Um, somewhat different, in many ways similar to what is now all the rage, which is agent-based uh, systems. And um, that led to Siri. So I'm the main inventor of the natural language technology behind Siri. Um, and my team started Siri, and obviously the rest is history. I, uh, I mean, these days, Siri isn't that good, but I mean, I was very happy with uh, the announcement just a few days ago uh, regarding uh, how Apple is thinking about AI and generative AI. I, I do think they've they've gotten it uh, gotten it right. It remains to be seen. Obviously, we'll have to play around with it. Uh, I only still have maybe a couple of friends still at Apple working on Siri, and they don't tell me anything. So, <laughs> yeah, know. it's a it's a very known uh, secretive company. Imagine seamless customer experiences, fast internet, and the bandwidth required to embrace new technologies. Are you ready to experience the network that makes it all possible? There's no network quite like Zayos. With North America's largest independently owned fiber network, Zayo provides the backbone connecting your organization to what's next. Thousands of data centers to cloud on-ramps, towers, and points of presence. Zayo's network carries massive amounts of data globally every single day. What really sets Zayo apart is their coast-to-coast -coast routes spanning from Canada into Mexico that you simply won't find anywhere else. The most innovative companies choose Zayo because they are not just connecting places, but connecting what's next for you. 
Discover the power of Zayo's network today. www.zayo.com slash network. In your perspective, what has enabled, because it feels like to the, let's say the general public who might not be uh, working on projects in AI specifically, but it does feel as though there's been huge leaps that we've now seen in the last, let's say two years, maybe even sooner than that, where, for example, like first it was, you know, ChatGPT got, in, in, and I know it's not first, but when Siri came out, it was like groundbreaking. In fact, my wife who worked at, who worked at KPMG at the time, KPMG quickly banned Siri because they said, hey, it's not allowed to come here. It doesn't know. I don't want it to hear what we're talking about. Or, you know, we're dealing with companies confident, confidential financials to, you know, so that was a huge momentum change. Um, GPT, obviously, was a huge momentum change. And then when, you know, Sora came out, people were like, oh, my God, what is Sora? Like, this thing's crazy. And so there does feel like there are tremendous leaps happening right now. I'd love to hear your perspective on what is enabling this change. Is it what's causing what feels like the hockey stick? Like, it feels like we're, we've now passed the hockey stick of AI. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely it does. And uh, for all of us, like m- maybe some of us realized that a little bit earlier than others, but more or less in the past few years, we've all been stunned by the emergent behavior of these models, what, what they can do that we didn't expect. Uh, even, even knowing how you built these models, like knowing the nitty gritty and detail did not prepare us for the amazement basically at how at scale they they are able to do the things they can. And yeah, scale is the key word. Uh, The fact is that things incrementally hit an inflection point, like processing capacity grew and became cheaper Mm. through time to the point where you could use it uh, to train uh, these very large uh, neural networks, basically, which are these large language models. Um, and in some ways, uh, that processing capacity was initially created for, you know, uh, graphical uh, yeah, gaming. interfaces <laughs> and gaming. Yeah, exactly. And uh, creatively repurposed for, for training neural networks. Uh, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is data. When I think back to the you know, 80s and 90s, we really didn't have very large repositories of, of digital data. I mean, today we take it for granted. Uh, today, uh, you know, just simply saying, yeah, we train our large language models on a snapshot of the internet. It's a snapshot of the internet. A, the internet is much, much, much larger than it was. Oh, yeah. uh, and B, you can actually get a snapshot of the internet and train on it. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. mind boggling. So scale on the data side. And yes, tweaks and changes to the way we architect and build and train neural networks. That didn't come overnight. It's been happening over the past 20 years or so with with, uh, breakthroughs on backpropagation, on architectures for deep learning, um, the latest of which is Transformers. And Transformers itself, that architecture is also kind of evolving and, and, and improving. But you know those three, like processing capacity, lots and lots of data, and then an architecture that can scale with that level of data. Um, and so uh, what happened, which is amazing, is, is we said, hey, um, let's train this thing on that data so it can predict, like, let's say we take a snapshot of the internet, we pick some point on the internet, I'm oversimplifying, and a few words from there, and tr- see if it can predict the next word. That's essentially what a language model is. And then, but let's run it on all of that and let's make it a very, very large neural network with this particular architecture and let's see what happens. And what happens was, it was just mind blowing. Um, You know, we didn't even expect this system to be able to um, translate from one language to another, understand language the way it does, be able to write code be able to do reasoning, some math. Uh, It's crazy. These systems are not trained for these particular tasks and the kind of the emergent behavior, just being forced to be able to predict what's next in this corpus of human knowledge that's distilled mostly in language is what has allowed these systems to uh, manifest uh, what we believe are facets of human intelligence. I was, you know, to, to like, 
I, I, I like to use this example on a consumer scale because people can understand this. But in 2016, you couldn't search things by, for example, objects in Google Photos, right? Now yeah. it can recognize my children as they've aged through time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And if I wanted to find a photo of my son playing baseball and I type in baseball, it'll bring me back so many accurate hits. It's, it's, it's phenomenal, right? In 2016, that wasn't available. The, now we're going into like these predictive models and things like that. And your, your three, your three pillars that kind of have helped accelerate with the actual infrastructure to scale and, you know, expand and decelerate as needed based on costs or needs, uh, the actual capacity of the chips and so on to actually throughput all this information. And then the, the raw scale of data would lead many to believe that, Cloud native companies are way in front now of the AI curve, of adopting the AI curve, and of course, bringing these services to their whatever their product or service is to the consumer. But it also means, and it tells me, and this is where I'm going to ask you the question, that all the companies that and industries that you serve that have traditionally maybe not as quickly adopted the cloud, like let's say manufacturing oil and gas utilities, I mean, they got to be running towards it now. I don't know <laughs> because because I also we talked about in our last guest with our last guest. You know, Nvidia came out. Jensen Huang came out in on his earnings report. He basically said that their chips are already bought for the next few years, and so they're that's, already that's in the right. mode of like rationing chips so that companies don't have a monopoly on all the chips. <laughs> and and so like if it wasn't that long ago when. The cloud sellers themselves said like, hey, we think only 20, 30% of world, the global workloads are actually in the cloud. I feel like they might not move to the cloud, but there's going to be pathways because everyone wants to take advantage of AI. What is happening right now in your from your perspective of companies trying to take advantage of this? Give us an idea of what the appetite, the acceleration is happening. Yeah, I mean, it's happening and you can't blame these companies. I mean, the, the reality is moving from on-prem or um, uh, you know, uh, in, in your data center, like moving from that onto the cloud is a big undertaking. Like you know, you have a business that's been running and running okay on low margins, maybe even, and you want to you know suddenly sink that much money to move stuff to the cloud and then get an ROI that you know might be a, a couple of years down, that's an investment. And so that explains so, how, so, why some companies, companies have been laggards. Um, and because there's, there's no very easy in-between incremental way of doing that. Like, you know, let me put some of my stuff on the cloud and keep some here. And, you know, now you're actually paying more and it just double or whatever, you know, I, it's, it's, I can empathize. <laughs> with yeah. why some of our clients have been slow to do this. But you're right. The, the fact is that um, today, if you're not on the cloud, you are behind and you have a tech debt that's accumulating, you know, really not even linearly. Um, <laughs> and you have, to, you, you have to make that move simply because the the near future is about uh, making use of AI in every facet of your systems. And these are not cheap, small models. You, you could do a hybrid thing like Apple is doing. Uh, it's, it's harder and the technology is not quite there. But, but still, to take the benefit of our most powerful AI models, you do need to be on the cloud. And so there is this cascading effect of, hey, I want that. It looks cool. My competitor yeah. has it. But the prereq just simply isn't there. I'm not on the cloud. So yeah, I'm with you. That I think I think that's uh that's the trend that we're seeing. Yeah. So what are you seeing when it comes to because you you mentioned it, tech debt, right? Because we Every system today is <laughs> substantially more complicated than the system previous, meaning the data flows through different uh, different databases. It gets transformed through different services. It's integrated with multiple partners and um, SaaS companies. Like data today right now is like the most complicated Frankenstein puzzled thing to see like from data from endpoint A to <laughs> outpoint Z. 
there's not enough letters of the alphabet to explain how many services that data probably goes through for, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, so is, is it getting harder to implement these things? Cause you kind of have to retrofit it too. Like it's, like you said, you kind of got to retrofit um, any new impl- implementation. Is it getting harder to implement? Because, because, because I feel like it would, like that's gotta be the biggest problem right now. Uh, yeah, well, that's it's natural, right? Take that accumulating, and then, and then you know you t- you talk to a client, and they are still running monolithic COBOL code of millions <laughs> of lines on like you know oh. <laughs> mainframes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's it. It and and it's legacy code with no comments. There's no documentation. You know. So yes, and when you think about it, how do you how do you lift and shift and 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 like pay back that tech debt? But there's good news. There's good news in this, which is now we have what we're calling AI agents. We have these very, very capable uh, generative AI based models that can do this or at least help us do this and take or uh, reduce the complexity uh, for all of the above. Like, you know, that transition from your legacy code, that transition to the cloud while also refactoring and maybe changing your models to microservices while also attending to the ever more complex data flow and data transitions. Um, I, I do think that we have more powerful tools now at our disposal than we've ever had to help us with this. And so maybe... If you're a company out there looking at, oh my God, what do I do with this tech debt? Uh, and it is a five-year, like millions of dollars kind of payback for me to, to get it upgraded. Maybe it's not. Maybe mm. you need to come talk to us <laughs> because, because we do have more powerful tools that can help us reduce that time, reduce that tech debt, and actually skip a bunch of steps uh, to get you to where you need to be. Uh, that's the good news in this, I think. That's awesome. That's awesome for yourself. You know, you, you get it, you get a really unique seat. I'd love for you to describe what you focus on, uh, in your role, uh, because, you know, that'll lead us of course, to the next level of the conversation. Cause I'd love to hear like what industries you're specifically working on, because I always have questions in all of these industries, uh, for anyone who's not familiar, Cognizant works from, I mean, I'm just going to read off a couple automotive banking, blue, what they call blue economy, which is like uh, green energy is a great example of blue economy, capital markets, media, consumer goods, education, healthcare, information, insurance, life science, manufacturing, oil, gas, retail, transportation, logistics, travel, hospitality, utilities. Sounds like you work with everybody. So (laughs) specifically for yourself, I know you oversee a lot of the AI transformations at Cognizant. What industries or are you working across all industries? Like we'd love to understand. Look, beyond the fact that Cognizant is an awesome company, and I'm not kidding, this is like, it's, it's a huge company with a startup attitude. What you just described is the reason why I'm at Cognizant. Like we are working and we're actually an extension uh, on on an IT and AI side for all of these industries, for for pushing these uh, companies in all of these industries to the next level and helping them, for example, AI enable. It's a unique position. Like if I wanted to go out and do a startup, um, I would have to focus on one area, one application, one industry, you know, and, you know, t- today I can pick up the phone and talk to the CIO or chief AI officer of any of the Fortune 1000. And not only that, I can talk to the Cognizant team that's working on their data, on their AI enablement process and see, and I can go to that CIO and tell them where they are and how and what is the next step that they need to take. It's a very, very unique position. And I'm working with AI. And AI is uh, a technology that is useful in all of these areas. And so if you want to bring AI to the real world, there's no better place to sit than where you can take it to and, and observe where and how it can be used in all of these very disparate, uh, very different um, use cases. So, but to your question of what do I do at, at Cognizant? <laughs> um, so I run our AI R&D. 
Um, I'm actually at our office right now here in downtown San Francisco, where we have a bunch of AI PhDs and researchers and and um, interns, uh, and we um, publish papers and peer-reviewed AI journals and and conferences. We um, have a lot of patents. It's a lot of very like cutting edge um, AI research that we do. Uh, but at the same time, the cohering principle around our research is how do you make use of AI in a responsible fashion for making decisions? And while that might sound trivial or obvious that, well, yeah, of course, AI should be used for making decisions, um, it, it actually is not. People are not familiar with that. When you talk to someone and say, hey, I use, do you use AI for making decisions? Uh, they're like, oh, yeah, the AI gives me all the charts and insights, and then I make the decisions. And I'm like, well, therefore, you're not using AI to make decisions, <laughs> right? So decision making is hard. Decision making, yes, it does entail looking at a lot of data and insights and predictions. But at the same time, it also has to do with balancing between a number of different outcomes, different KPI that are not necessarily aligned. Often they're not. Like if you look at a business, they want to increase their revenue while you know reducing their, their costs sure. while being responsible and ethical and green. Like they, there's so many different angles to this. How do you make a decision on a day-to-day basis to hit that KPI? Uh, and so we have a methodology for, for how you do that. We have a platform called NeuroAI that, uh, that my uh, team um, contributes to. And we take it to our clients. And believe it or not, when we engage with a client, we don't even ask the client what the use case is. Really? Um, we actually make use of this agent-based approach where we use Gen AI to identify use cases for the client, to scope them, to produce synthetic data that resembles the data that the client has, and then to basically string together a number of agents. So it's very meta, like you use agents to create a string of agents that represent the use case that ends up being an AI-based decisioning system. And I can build one for you in like 15 minutes. Um, I've done it on stage without knowing what that use case is going to be. So um, so that's, let's, that's the future. <laughs> <laughs> let's walk. Let's walk someone through that. Okay. okay, let's walk through them because the, that that is. Um, I feel like I understand, but at the same time, my mind is blown. All right, so yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to. I always use the travel industry because the travel industry is, I think, something that just about everyone has had experience with. Uh, so let's use something really current right now uh, in the news, which is um, right now in Miami. There's been excessive rain, and you know. Unfortunately, there is a lot of flooding. Okay, so this is going to disrupt the travel industry because uh, even if it wasn't at the airport, the workers can't get to the workers can't get to work, right? Because the roads are blocked. So I've already been alerted through American Airlines that um, hey, hey, there's going to be travel delays. Okay, so American might come to you and say, "Here's our problem. How do we solve for the water?" But you would say, "How do you know the water is even your problem? Maybe you have exactly. something else." Is that what you're telling yes. me? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. No, absolutely. That's right. I mean, you don't have to uh, pigeonhole yourself into the, you know, legacy thinking about the problem that you're tackling, because right now we can actually view it in a much, much broader sense. And we can bring in all the constituents and help you in how you should approach and tackle that the, the problem that you're looking for and you're looking at. Um, there, there, there are two ways you can do this, right? One is to say, um, yeah, I'm an airline, and uh, you know, which obviously is in travel uh, industry, and um, I have uh, um, weather-related uh, issues. And then just leave it at that and have the agent go, okay, the types of decisions, I mean, we're, we're, we're really starting at the very, very top. Like the types of decisions that you would care about are these. And let me tell you which one of these like five different types of decisions that you care about, if you tackle with AI, which one is going to give you the most bang for the buck the fastest? So before even you decide where to invest to AI enable that decision making, let's do some analysis 
some reasoning around, okay, if you pay this much and you attend to this piece of the decision-making process and solve it by whatever percent, here's the ROI, here's the, here's the, therefore, does it make sense? And there's, of course, the urgency aspect as well, right? So that's, that's the very first step. Okay, good, great. I like it. Let's do that. All right. Now the next step is that's handed off to another agent. And when I say agent, I'm talking about AI agents. The next agent is going to look at that and go, okay, American Airlines and weather. So I have access to this set of weather data that's coming in. And historically I have that. I have access to airline disruption data. I know that within American Airlines, or at least I can guess that within American Airlines, they are collecting data around, for example, routes, uh, uh, you know, um, costs, redirection costs, you know, their hubs, whatever stuff that data that's very specific to American Airlines. And the system is going to list the data attributes that it thinks could be available that would help with this kind of decision use case. And I'll show it to the American Airlines guy and say, hey, you know, is this reasonable? And Grant, I mean, we're cognizant. We'll come in and help you bring all these uh, data sources together. Like, you know, don't worry about that aspect. Let's just look at the reasonableness. Also, here are the outcomes that we're solving for. You know, obviously there's a cost issue. There's a delay issue. There's a customer satisfaction issue uh, question here. There is a, um, you know, let, let's say environmental issue uh, yeah. at question as well. Are these the outcomes that you care about that you're solving for? And how much of which and which one is more important? So, okay, we're going to do that interview piece. And we'll, at the other end of this, we'll come up with a scoping for this particular use case. And then we will generate synthetic data. And I can't emphasize enough the role of synthetic data today in building an end-to-end system and then iterating on that. And so you that's the next step. The, the, the next agent that comes in goes, oh, okay, I can see this is the scope of the problem and this is the data types that you need. I can see these are the relationships. This is the distribution of the data. I, I can guess. Let me produce some synthetic data that resembles the data that I think that we will be able to get. And then you when you when you have the synthetic data and you have the scope, now you string together agents that can become the AI twin or simulation for you know that disruption that's happening in the travel, and you can have another agent that kind of looks at that at that simulation basically an AI based simulation, and tries various different scenarios. Let's see if we route these flights this way, or let's see if we you know temporarily move some of our um, planes to this hub here or whatever, what's going to happen, tries various different scenarios against that AI twin, and then comes back and says, here's the art of the possible. Now, of course, granted, all of this is on synthetic data, but the synthetic data is kind of similar to what what the reality is. But it'll say, here's the art of the possible. Um, You know, we think that with this kind of um, a cost hit, you're going to save this much time for your customers, your customers are going to, you're not gonna get much of a hit on your customer satisfaction. Also, given the routes that we've chosen, you're not gonna emit this much you know, CO2 or whatever, um, because these were your, your, your goals. And hey, we'll give you the possibility to run what if scenarios. Like you'll look at that and go, okay, that suggestion makes sense, but what if we do this other thing? Like, can you, can you tell me what's gonna happen there? So that's, I mean, I know I'm, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here, but the fact is that's the approach. At The, the end piece of this is a, a, a client that is seeing, you know, an AI-based decisioning, decision augmentation system that's addressing exactly the problem that they, they're facing and looking at. And a team, a company that can come in and help, you know, make that real based on the real data that, that is available. That was when I was listening to that. I was thinking in my mind of a couple things. One, it feels like because um, we've talked to some team members who talk about digital twins, like they actually, yeah, because prototyping and manufacturing is too hard. Like you can't if you have to build the physical thing first to see if it works. 
like, could you simulate it? Could you simulate how good it could be? Um, and like, so it sounds like almost digital twinning a business business process instead of a machine. Yeah. You know, Albert, you pointed a very important uh, uh, to to a very important problem here. Digital twins are are, are really cool. If you have one, <laughs> don't don't get rid of it. It's really useful. Building them is very very difficult. You have to put in a lot of assumptions into a digital twin. Yeah. Uh, and those assumptions will change. The fact is the world changes. <laughs> Things change. And those assumptions will, will not hold. So what do you do when that happens? Um, and so even if you have a good digital twin, what I would tell you is augment that. Add an AI twin to that because your AI twin is going to be reactive to the change in the world. It'll be able to, you know, you'll get the best of both. Uh, you know, the details of the digital twin while the data-oriented robustness of the AI twin and bring both of them together. And then, of course, on top of that, you bring in that optimization on the decision-making. When I hear that, I think, you know, in I'm stuck in aviation right now, but of course, right now, I think it's fair to say that, you know, like airline company like Boeing has come under a lot of scrutiny lately for the quality of its main, main and everyone knows about what happened with the, um, the Max plane in the MCAS system. So for example, the MCAS legendarily only had one sensor. And so if that sensor failed, then they didn't know, they basically didn't test that. Um, and so an AI twin almost, or an AI twin on top of a digital twin is the kind of thing that would just start creating scenarios. Well, what if a goose hits the sensor, then what? <laughs> right? There's that, and yeah, absolutely. It makes you wonder because, because like you said, if you've only, if you've plugged in the variables, then you're really not testing a system completely. You're testing a system against the variables that have been plugged in. Exactly, that's right. <laughs> um, we we had like when you think about SCIR models when it comes to um, uh, you know the, the pandemic, for example, a few years ago we were all like looking at models as of 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 how COVID is changing and so forth. The same thing. I mean, those models are you put in a bunch of assumptions. If you remember at the beginning of COVID, we didn't know. Like we didn't yeah. know too much about this virus. And so those assumptions were like really wild guesses as to what we think this might do and and the how mortality people, rate, the incubation right. period and then was all an assumption. How are people reacting to it? Like <laughs> yeah. you look at the world, like different countries are putting different policies in place. People in you know, I don't know, um uh, Hong Kong, China, uh, you know, mask mandates maybe weren't even yeah. needed because people were just wearing masks. It, it was part of the culture here. It was it was very different. So, yeah. you know, how do you Sweden even, was just like, yeah, we're not even going to stop. We're, we're not, we're even not gonna, changing. <laughs> right. Exactly. So how do you how do you build those sorts of assumptions into your model if you if you're not sure what the reactions are going to be? And then, of course, now I have a model a vaccine comes in. All bets are off. You know, how, or, or, or I don't know, Paxovit comes in and all yeah. bets are off. So the assumptions that you've made are not going to hold. You need something that can keep up, that you can pump the latest data into it, and it can say, ah, I see that, you know, some of my assumptions were wrong, or I need to... So uh, I, I think that is, that is the right approach. And that's, that's a big part of what we do here is create that AI twin. If there is a digital twin, pair them up with one another, and then do that optimization against it to come up with the uh, uh, decision augmentation. You know, in, the, in just a moment ago, I gave you, uh, you know, one hypothetical scenario, one real scenario. I'd love to hear what are some of the things or uh, whether it's a process, invention, uh, you know, what are, what are companies, what changes are they making that we as consumers are going to feel or see and experience in like the next 12 months that is going to be, you know, po possibly different than what we've experienced before? I'm recently um, amazed by an observation uh, that companies without quite realizing are inching their way towards making all of their applications and software agent-based without even realizing that. And it's like this like creeping, what do they call it? These, uh, 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 you know, coup d'etat, like it's just, uh, you know, without, <laughs> without. Um, and so what's, what's happening? Um, the obvious use case of generative AI is a chat GPT-like or chatbot uh, interface into my proprietary data. 
Okay. Um, and so just think about it. Like you have an intranet. It's being used. There's a lot of apps there, but people are just, you know, pulling their hair out, trying to find the app that they, they need to use. Or you have some sort of like um, data set behind, behind your firewall and you want to give people access to it. But it's like tons and tons of PDF documents. And it's very difficult to get to them. And now this technology comes ar around and you're like, oh, ChatGPT, this is so cool. I can, it just understands what I'm asking for. But I mean, if it's, it's doing it against the network, like internet, uh, can it do it against my data? So that's the natural move. There are technologies you might have heard, such as uh, retrieval augmented generation and so forth, that allow us to cre you know, take these ChatGPT-like um, uh, models and point them at our proprietary data and uh, create what for the user would look like ChatGPT, but it knows about our data, right? And many of our clients are doing this. Um, but then there's a very natural next step beyond that. You're like, okay, now I have a really cool, useful ChatGPT-like interface into my PDF data repository, but I also have this microservice. Um, and um, you know, can I actually have a ChatGPT-like interface into that? Or I have this database. Let's use that as an example. I have this database, you know, not like a fraction of my users know SQL. Um, but the data is really interesting. So can I actually use an, a large language model, a gen AI system, and have this kind of like be able to type in in natural language what I'm asking for and for it to actually, on my behalf, write the SQL and get the data back and it's coming from the database so the data is reliable. So, okay, that's step two. I go from, you know, I have a chat GPT interface into my PDFs. Now I have a chat GPT interface into my database. Now, what if somebody talking to the first one has a query that could be answered by the second one. Are we going to ask the user to decide whether their query is best resolved going to the PDFs or the database, and then based on that, go talk to that avatar or chatbot? I mean, that's kind of silly. What if we could actually have the same chat interface decide whether it, the query is best resolved from the PDFs or from, from the database? The moment you start thinking that way, and some of our clients are, you're, you're thinking multi-agent system. I have one agent that's representing my PDFs. I have one agent that's representing my database. I might have an agent that's representing my microservice and API calls. What if I bring them all together? The three agents talking to the one top agent that actually decides who to reroute this to. Those agents are now talking to each other in natural language. It's very robust. I can change a service. I can yank it out. The new service I bring in might have a completely different API, but the large language model agent sitting there is so robust, it's so powerful that it doesn't care. The API changes, it just changes the way it calls the API. From my perspective, it's transparent. From a integration perspective, it's not a big lift. So to your question, where I see this going is we're starting to see organizations, enterprises, businesses, gradually, without knowing, moving into an agent-oriented architecture. Um, and this gives us a lot of power. It makes it robust. It makes it scalable. It allows us to interrogate all the various different data and features and API and whatever else that we have in our business internally or externally. Um, uh, it allows us to interrogate them using natural language. It allows us to add more agents that can check to see how well this whole thing is operating, maybe improve the whole process. It allows each one of these agents to actually log the intent that they had and the reasoning that they had in fulfilling the queries that are coming in. Just think about it, like logging is gonna move from, oh, these like, you know, this query with this call at this moment went to this, whatever, it's going to change into, I had a query and I decided to take these steps. Here's the reasoning I took and it's all in natural language. I can go back and look at the log and understand exactly why something happened. And from a responsible AI perspective, I can actually have checks and balances as to whether or not that query or that call is within my responsible AI guidelines, whether it's ethical, whether the response that's coming back is acceptable. Things that when you think about, it, when you take all of those away, 
uh, we don't have, even today, in a non-AI-oriented world, we, we can't know that. And now we can. Like, we've, we've actually, we can spread this, this um, layer of intelligence across our entire enterprise. Um, so what I just described, uh, not too many people are thinking this way, but I'm observing that, that it is happening without us actually knowing. And I think that's the brave new world of, um, you know, we talked at the beginning of this, uh, uh, we talked about the move to the cloud and how it was hard. Remember I said, I sympathize with these clients because it's hard to go from an on-prem like legacy. There's a lot of um, work to be done and, and, and you know, to, to move on. Uh, what we're seeing with this move from, uh, you know, this log legacy software architecture and application flow to an agent-based one is it's incremental. It's natural. Uh, you know, it's like peeling the onion. You, you, you add the first layer of chatbots on the periphery and it's just natural to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. Before you know it, in a very incremental way, you've agent-oriented your entire enterprise, which I think is what's going to happen. I don't know what timeline it's, but I think it's going to happen in the next months and, uh, you know, year or two. I, I think that's the future. If that happens, the way I was hearing you describe it, I'm just thinking of myself and what we do at Mission. Like this is going to make work a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, it's it's going so like I'll give you an example of something we do that there's no agent and there's no API that if there were two agents talking to each other, this might be extremely helpful. Um so so a good example would be like, "Hey, so we record a lot of footage, right? We record a lot of footage." Um sometimes our customers will ask us questions like because these shows are sponsored. Um so our customer might ask us, like, who cares about network architecture? And so we don't know. <laughs> like, so to be able to sift through all those things, right? And they're like, could we, could you make us clips of those, of those, of uh, network architecture clips that we want to post on social? So how we do it today is we manually go through it. We grab the clips. We then use our editing tool. Um, and then we like, buy some ad units with it. So I'm going to manually load up ad. But like, what if you could tell an agent like, hey, and then go load these to my Facebook ads manager. And they load them up. It's like, and then the Facebook ads manager is going to obviously have a winner, right? It's like, hey, what are the characteristics of the of the ones that get the most views. And it might come back and teach us like, oh, when the guy lights up and he's got headphones and, <laughs> and he talks about this, like this yep. is how people get viewed. Like, wait a second. Like these are all things that we are left to always try to figure out. You know what I mean? I love that. You're, you're already thinking in an agent oriented manner. You, that's exactly what I, why I think it's so natural because you just rattled off at least not two. I think there was like four <laughs> different agents each doing like from the, oh, I want to do this search to find the clips to, oh, I actually want to extract the clips and edit them together to, oh, I, I need to like insert ads into there. You know, you already, okay, does it make sense to have four disparate agents to do this? Or is this going to be like coordinated with another set of agents that are sitting on top and talking to these guys so that when the original when, when you're talking to your system, you're talking to one agent. Now that agent is also like coordinating with these agents representing the different functionality. Um, yeah. But but it's it's doing that on your behalf. It's deciding like, oh, the first step is this. Let me talk to this agent. Okay, I got that. Now I want to get the clips. Now that I'm going to talk to that. So you're already thinking in that in those terms. Um, and, and imagine, like, as you said, just imagine how your world is so much more simplified. Um, and, um, and then, you know, you talk about, for example, extracting the clips. You might have paid a lot for some software that allows you to extract or edit the clips. And for some, whatever reason, you decide, you know what, there's this other software, it's a little cheaper and it's actually better. And I want to move to that. Just imagine if you want to do that right now in your job. You're like, oh, my God, that's going to take six months. It's going to be disruptive. <laughs> we have to go learn I gotta it. got to submit it through procurement. Like how long Everything is going to break. <laughs> you know, how do I even do that? Whereas, no, I have this agent and I can just like, unplug the original the legacy software, plug in the new software and 
it's like magically it because the functionality essentially is the same and the input to the agent is natural language you're expressing your intent that intent by the agent is being translated into those calls that are very specific to that actual application so that already gives you perspective as to how robust and um uh you know smoother uh these things are going to be so though, again going back to the initial discussion that we had like tech debt um is now going to be easier to pay back because updating and upgrading these various different constituents of your system is going to be easier because they're all hidden under these layers of language understanding agents that can do that mapping on your behalf you don't have to you don't have to go rewire everything every time I'm getting fired up because it could be because when I, because when, that what I just described in workflow takes I mean it often takes let's say two to three weeks to get an answer because I have to go search it I have to go make these clips I have to go publish because uh, consumer uh, consumer habits is one of those things where like you can you can model whatever you want but until people have a choice of watching something or spending money on something you really don't know you know what I mean <laughs> like yeah, they might not exactly. watch it and so so something that takes like a, a simple question like one of our sponsors is hey I'd love to do a simple paid engagement where I want to sponsor a newsletter can you find me a great clip and link people to all the great stories that you've told about this subject like that's a simple request yeah it's a hard process right now to do it. And it involves many tools and people. And so if I had a super agent, like my suit, like I've mentioned in other episodes, like a Jarvis, like Iron Man yeah. had, go figure this out for me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Years ago, I don't know if you, have you seen MASH, the the TV series, MASH? Maybe yeah. Not. Yeah. yeah. Have. Okay. Yeah. You remember Radar O'Reilly and MASH? Uh, he was he was the little guy that was like he was he was the guy that was um, like knew the choppers are coming before the choppers were coming or or the sergeant would be asking for a file yeah. and the file was in his hands already and stuff like that. That's kind of the future. I mean, that's I think I think that's what we're looking at here. Um, anticipate, understand, and 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 just go out and do this stuff um, on your behalf in a multi-agent. Uh, uh, manner. So I I I want to I want to be very clear. We can't have a single model do all of this for you. It's just not the technology is not there. And even if it were, yeah. it wouldn't work. You know, it's about uh, representing features and functions and data and API and all all that with different agents, each representing one, and then them talking to each other and resolving. You know, whatever. Um, uh, query or, or uh, intent that the users have. I think that it's that's the future of software. Well, the, the what particularly what I'm happy about talking with you about is that I think for a lot of us as general consumers, we might feel like our service providers are kind of slow. You know, like I think that's like the general consensus of among people. It's like uh, like my cable company is slow, my internet service might be slow, my repair team that fixes my house slow. I pay taxes to the IRS. They're slow. Like everyone thinks of slow, right? Um, and most people think a lot. I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, it doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of people think they hold companies to a really high standard that they have to hit. And so it's exciting to hear that there's this many companies trying to do this. Yes, of course, they're trying to save money, but ultimately they also know that if we have a better experience, it's more easy to, for us to get what we want as consumers they also, that's, that's really how to win. And so I, uh, it, it gets me excited talking to people like yourself because you're working on such an array of projects, you know, <laughs> but before, you know, we're back. It was fun, fun having you, but yeah. <laughs> before you go, I have some scenarios I'd like yeah. for you to answer. And you tell me how close we are to solving these problems with AI or agents upon a um, super agent with agents. All right. You ready? These are everyday problems that I think we have or will have ready. All right. All right. Are we getting to the point where AI can recognize AI? Cause I hear about like the new phone scam where people are emulating, like maybe the voice of someone you love and tricking people. It's like, will my AI recognize it's talking to AI? It's an adversarial problem isn't it like you know you you get an ai to to recognize the, the other ai as soon as you have one you can train 
the scammer AI against the you know recognizer AI and get make it better. And then once you have that, you can you can train the other <laughs> AI. So unfortunately, that's uh, yeah, um, good guys versus bad guys kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if there's an end to, end to that, unfortunately. Can when do you think AI can um, differentiate between fact and fiction? Because I read about how one of these lawyers he used AI to defend his case. It turned out the AI was reading from like fictitious cases, and uh, that's an example. This lawyer's of, been disbarred. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 an example of of completely misunderstanding and misusing AI. So. Let, let, let me use a human analogy. Um, if I ask you, you know, what is two to the power of 50? Um, you're, you're not gonna, or 50 is too large. I don't know, two to the power I mean, I of do, whatever. Give, give, me, right? give me two squared, four. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to the power of, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, let's just go with 50. Um, or what is what is pi to, to you know, 20 uh, digits, right? A, a, an easier one for some of us. So. If I asked you that, you're going to go, well, I think it's 314, I don't know. And then maybe you'll make up the rest because I've forced you to actually give me the entire thing and hope that, you know, by luck, maybe some of the digits will be, be, will be right. I'm asking you to pull from memory, your learning, yeah. to give me an answer. And of course, you're, you're likely to make some mistakes. What would be reasonable would be for me to say, can you give me pi to 20 digits? And you pick up a calculator <laughs> and type it in and get pi to 20 digits or 50 or whatever number of digits and give it to me and say, I think this is a reliable answer because I used a calculator that I, I can rely on. That's the difference. If you use an AI system, give it the tools, and then through its reasoning, it will go use those tools and answer you the question. You will get a much, much more reliable answer than if you just say, hey, pull from your memory and give me something, right? <laughs> and that's the misuse. If this lawyer had said, hey, I have a database of cases that are yeah. relevant, and I don't just have the time or can't really go search and whatever, can you go search and find me some... The likelihood of this mistake ha happening and this guy being disbarred would have been much, much smaller next to zero right. because the AI would know to go search it, use some reasoning, even double check, make sure the case is relevant and come back and say, here are the cases you're going to use. I bet it would do a better job than the lawyer doing it manually. But they didn't do that. The lawyer's like, just give me out of nothing. I'm not even going to give you the tools. Well, of course that happens. So... That's a lot. I mean, I feel sometimes that I have to defend AI against yeah. this. <laughs> All right. Here's some, here's some fun ones. All right. How soon are we as a society or anywhere uh, accurately predicting the weather? <laughs> Actually, I read just uh, last week that, that we have much more accurate weather prediction systems that are based on these uh, uh, newer AI approaches um, rather than... Again, I mean, it goes back to our discussion about uh, digital twin versus AI twin. Like, you know, if you have it for, for your weather model, you have to plug in all the data and a lot of granularity. And you have this like um, model that does the prediction for you versus you have an AI based model that as 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 trained on a lot of data. And as the data changes, it can keep up with that. I think that's the difference. Um, but I'm evading the answer. The, the real answer is never. It's weather. Come on. It's too many, too many variables. <laughs> it's just too many it's variables. Too chaotic. <laughs> too chaotic. All right, here we go. Find an available babysitter. <laughs> Find an available babysitter. That's tough too, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think I think we'll see more and more services where these agent-based um, AI systems will will uh, figure things out on your behalf, and you delegate to them some of the reasoning that you do manually in trying to find a babysitter, for example. So I was thinking about this because I actually had to find a plumber uh, recently, and you know, if if it's an emergency plumbing situation, a lot of times you're stuck making a lot of phone calls. Hey, I can't come today. I can't come today. That's typically what's happening. And you'll stop when you find the guy that can come. Uh -huh. But I was one, I was thinking like in the future, could there be like a, the Sabre network is uh, for anyone who's listening, not familiar is where the airlines can plug in their flight data. And that's what allows you to search Google for flights. And it could tell you flights across all the different airlines that plug into Sabre. Could there ever be a, um, 
uh, you know, like a household services, a saber equivalent, which can read, you know, someone's calendar and instantly bring you in search. Here are the, you know, 20 service providers within 20 minutes of you that don't have a calendar block right now. Start calling here. And oh my and, God. Well, yes. <laughs> I need that like yesterday. Absolutely. Let's do it. You know what I mean? You know what I, mean? I think of, I think of these, you. these really practical things like, because one of the things you said about agent to agent conversations, which will really unlock is sometimes even if companies have APIs, the reality is you need an engineer to connect it. Yeah. And that is your actual blocker, right? And so like, oh, the right. service has an API. But yeah, but who's going to build this, this technology interface exactly. that lets it talk to something else reasonably? Uh, you're right. I think you're right. I mean, it's much easier to build these systems now than and than ever. So, you know, yeah, uh, hopefully. Yeah. Well, listen, when, the, when that day comes, I can't wait. Because these are the things I think about in like everyday use cases that... Yeah. I feel like we're getting close. It's getting close where I don't think it, I don't, I think that the the Jarvis do everything for me is pretty far away, but I think some of these simple bridges that we, as people spend a lot of time and energy, maybe chasing a little bit. I'm hoping that narrowed. we get there. Yeah. We get there incrementally. That it's, that's the path is we keep creating these agents for these various different services and we enable them to work together and talk together. At some point, we'll be like, okay, there is that Jarvis or, the, or, or equivalent or close to, which in communication with the other agents can can do a lot, a lot more than um, we can imagine right now. That's awesome. Well, listen, Bobak, I appreciate you joining us today on the show. It was awesome hearing about your your agent to agent discussion. I thought it was really cool. Uh, it got my brain thinking about all the things that can be built, hopefully in the future. Uh, and I... and. You know, it's just really, I think, positive. I, I, I think of it as like, I think I am always leaning towards the idea that technology, while there are dark sides to anything that's any progress, in the large majority, as society has shown, technology does make our lives better. So I can't wait for these things to start hitting the real world. And listen, if it can figure out a way for me to find a babysitter and plumber, like as I need it instantly, and so many people will be happy out there. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today on IT Visionaries. It was very fun. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Imagine a world where your data flows like electricity, unseen, yet powering everything you do. A world where high availability, low latency, and disaster recovery are not just expectations, but realities. Welcome to the future, powered by Zayo's network. Zayo has meticulously designed North America's largest independent fiber network, a network that isn't just vast, but strategically planned connecting the places that matter most to you. Thousands of data centers, cloud on-ramps, towers, and critical points of presence. Cross-continental routes unique to Zayo offer connections that you just can't find anywhere else. Zayo provides routing diversity that ensures your operations never skip a beat and ultra-low latency for when microseconds matter. In a world that never stops, Zayo is the network underneath it all, helping the most innovative and forward-thinking companies grow. Because Zayo doesn't just connect places, they connect possibilities. Discover the power of Zayo's network today. Visit www.zayo.com network.